at the top, there are a lot of men. Mm -hmm. A lot, okay? I'm on every single stage, every single time, all of them. All of them. Surrounded by men with these gigantic checks. You look at the Network Marketing Hall of Fame, the Million Dollar a Year Earners, it's man, 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 woman, man, 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 woman, woman, man, man. Tons of men. Men, I will tell you, are the ones who solely recruit. Men. Yup. They're recruiting however many legs they need, whether that's two or three, generally speaking. They'll get two recruits, three recruits. They'll stack whatever they need to stack. And the women are the ones building ethically under them with customers, with team members, running calls, nurturing, running incentive contests, doing all of the nurturing work and you're damn right it's a man is she kind of admitting then to get to the top it's about recruiting yeah because she just said and also that that's unethical do you know the saying those who can't do teach what about the saying those who can't mlm coach the mlm industry is full of self-proclaimed business coaches and motivational gurus their goal, they say, is to teach aspiring network marketers how they can take their business to the next level. For a small fee, of course. The question is, though, how successful were or are these MLM coaches at building their own MLM businesses? Or are they just capitalizing on struggling new recruits by claiming they know the way? Are they simply the general store owners of today's gig economy capitalizing on our collective gold fever? Today, we're going to be reacting to two of these MLM coaches, Jesse Lee Ward and Colleen Nichols. I only recently became aware of these two, but they both have quite the large followings on social media. Jesse Lee, who calls herself Boss Lee, has almost 300,000 followers on Instagram. She goes live almost every single day with free training, which unsurprisingly is mostly motivational in nature, but she also dedicates a lot of her content to debunking anti-MLM arguments. I don't really watch cute. TV. Like, no one cares. You don't get an award because you watch less TV. I do find it rather odd that a supposed business owner who claims to have made almost $300 million in sales is spending so much of her time talking about those she views as opposition. I mean, if you're a business owner, wouldn't you be spending your time, I don't know, running your business? But I digress. Jessie is a rep for an MLM called Prove It that sells supplements and other health products. She's made it to the second highest rank of the company, but up until recently, she claimed on her Instagram bio to be the world's number one network marketer, which I found to be an interesting claim considering A, I'm not sure how you'd validate a claim like that, and B, she hasn't even made it to the top of her own company. Much like Jessie Lee, Colleen, who has over 100,000 followers on her Instagram page, No Shame Sales Game, dedicates much of her content to addressing critiques of the MLM industry. Every corporation is a pyramid. I prefer the kind where I don't have to ask for a promotion or a raise because I can create it myself. Critic, great, you joined a network marketing company, so I guess that means you'll try to recruit me. Me, oh sweetheart, you're not my type. Colleen is a high-ranking distributor for an MLM called Rodan and Fields that sells very, very, very expensive skincare. She also calls herself the anti-hey girl, which I guess means she isn't a fan of people trying to recruit using those cold messages that start with hey girl. I agree with her on that. Those cold messages are really just the worst. I recently saw that Jesse and Colleen went live on Instagram together to discuss the anti-MLM movement. After watching their live stream, I knew I had to address the many, many outrageous claims they made. So today we're gonna do just that. I'm gonna be reacting to their live along with Drew from Genetically Modified Skeptic. If you guys don't know who Drew is, he's this really, really small, basically no name creator. Honestly, I'm just trying to give him a leg up in the YouTube world by having him on my channel. So guys, please help him out by checking out his channel. Was that sarcasm? 
Also, I'm going to be dividing this into two separate videos because Jesse and Colleen's live is almost an hour long, which is much too long for us to address in one sitting. This is part one, so be sure to tune in later this week for part two. All right, let's go ahead and dive right in. Hello, hello, everybody. What's going on? It's Jesse Lee. You can call me hashtag boss Steve. And this is the interview you guys have all been waiting for. I'm going to wait. Uh, I'm not waiting for anything. I'm going to have Colleen Nichols come on here. This is, uh, I'm so excited for this conversation. So, um, I know a lot of you have been waiting for this and, um, we're going to, we're going to get going. So this is the anti, anti MLM, uh, conversation. We'll jump right into it. People are, well, look at all these people. Um, it's one of those things that I think on a, you know, people who are just starting in network marketing or they've been in there for a while, get messages all the time. People are like, people are being mean to me or they're saying mean things. And I had one person write a mean capture or mean comment on my post. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so sweet that somebody wrote a mean comment on your post. So like, how, Jesse Lee, do you have people on the internet that don't like you? <laughs> what an epic first question. Okay, so Colleen wants to know if Jesse Lee has anyone on the internet who doesn't like her. I mean, it is, I, it is shock and awe, you know, shock and awe um, that that I do, in fact, have quite a, a quite the following of haters. And um, I got to tell you, it's we can get deep, deep into this, but I will say, I, I have friends who will say stuff like, haters are confused fans. I truly believe in that. Truly. Um, Truly. Um, and then I will also say that the more people who started liking me less and less and less and the louder and louder and louder and louder and louder they got, the bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger my businesses grew. I actually posted my... I mean, what if your business grew bigger and bigger and bigger and you got more and more and more haters? <laughs> what if the causal <laughs> good point. link is opposite? Yeah. Also, I, I don't know how to verify that, like, her, if her business has grown, how do we know that's due to haters? I kind of very much doubt that. I don't know. <laughs> I, my uh, Google Analytics that were sent to me by someone who runs SEO and keyword searches and whatever, he sent it to me last night. He's like, Jesse Lee, this is, like, very impressive. I'm like, well, I couldn't have done it alone. <laughs> I mean, I think just because people are looking you up or people are landing on your page doesn't necessarily translate to more business or more money. Not necessarily. Like, I don't know if it's the case. Like, just, it might be the case that more people have found her Instagram page or her website or whatever, but does that mean that she's had more people sign up for her training or join her Prove It business? I don't know. I mean, it could be, but just SEL alone doesn't show that. Yeah. Talking is talking is talking. And I say that all the time. Like the reason I like got started in doing what I do, like, is because I saw how loud like they can be. And I'm just like, we need more like loud people on our side, right? Like they're not so loud. There's not being, and so we're just like making waves. So yeah, okay, people don't like you. Um, they don't like me. We were DMing. Well, actually, hold on a second. Like, I'll actually answer it a different way too. I don't think it's that they don't like me, and I don't think it's that they don't like you. I think it's that they don't like themselves. Yeah. What if it's that we don't like your business model? <laughs> no, like, it's just we're haters and we don't like ourselves. So that's why we're doing this, of I, course. I don't have anything personal against either one of these people. I mean, you didn't even know who these people were. Or you don't really know. Yeah, I don't know who these people are. I, I don't have any reason to have something personal against them, but I'm willing to potentially critique what they're going to say because they're promoting a business model that's been shown to be incredibly damaging to people, at least yeah. financially. Yeah. That's very Dr. Phil of you to say, it's true. Well, you know, um, let's, Her let's you know, make a video about this. Just call me Dr. Jesse Lee, I said that. <laughs> uh, but it, it, <laughs> in, in all seriousness though, um, I, re I, don't, I don't blame them. If you failed at everything in, in your life, if you have tried and tried and tried again, and you think that you've done all the right things, and you're not seeing success, and you never had your breakthrough, and you don't understand the process of little simple habits compounding over time, and then it's so much easier to blame everything else instead of taking responsibility and accountability for your actions and for your results. Yeah, I would probably blame you. I mean, I have more 
of a following than both of them combined and I talk against this. I don't I don't speak against MLMs because I'm a failure. I speak against MLMs because I care about other human yeah. beings. <laughs> that's all that's required. And this is very typical like MLM rhetoric. Like we're only critiquing them because we actually hate ourselves and because we've all failed at whatever we've tried at life. So now we're just sitting here bitter, just trying to like talk shit about other people when that's not the case. It has nothing to do with the people that are in this industry. It has to do with the fact that this there's actual data to show that this industry is not viable for the vast majority of people. Right. It has nothing to do with like anything going on in my life or these women's lives. It's just the business model. We don't like it. Yeah, because it sucks to watch somebody who's doing well, right? Like it sucks to be like sitting wherever you're sitting and I'm sure they would say like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I love my life. I'm in my favorite cubicle. Like it's great. Um, but they just, it's hard. To, and I've, I, but I want to like sympathize with those people because I've been there. I've been on the other side watching people succeed when I wasn't. And I was like, fuck this person. Like I hated watching their stuff. I hated all the, you know, the happy stuff they were talking about. And then finally I was like, shit, like, if she can do it, then why don't I just stop hating for a second and just try it, and then maybe I could go on a food. I have to say, I, I cannot relate to the experience of hating someone because of their success. Yeah. That doesn't that doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, yeah, it has nothing to do with their success at all. It has to do with the fact that why are they successful? Are they successful because they're actually selling? Or are yeah. they successful because they have thousands and thousands of people in their downline that are losing money? Like, right. why are they successful? That's what we're critiquing. Exactly. And it just, it's very much reminds me of that, like, one scene in Mean Girls where it's, like, that, near the end of the movie where Janice is, like, uh, calling Katie out for not coming to her art show, like, calling her out for something she did wrong, critiquing her. And then Katie's like, it's not my fault that you're, like, obsessed with me or yeah. something. You know what? It's not my fault you're, like, in love with me or something. <laughs> what? Oh, no, she did not. It's like, it reminds me of that. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. I mean, it's, it's just taking a problem that you legitimately do have and projecting it onto yeah. someone else. Yeah, and it's a way for them to, not only for themselves, but also to teach their followers a way to avoid critical thinking mm -hmm. by using these cliches, like they hate themselves or... Uh, haters are just confused fans. It's just a use of loaded language and cliches in order to avoid having to think critically. I can answer that too. It's another psychology thing. So again, Dr. Jesse Lee will come out for you, but if people don't like change. They don't. People are very resistant to that. And so if you're constantly told that you're supposed to believe one thing and you're constantly told that the honorable way of living is to struggle and the honorable way of living is to go to work from eight o'clock in the morning until five o'clock at night. And by the way, hold on a second, because people, not everybody's an entrepreneur, okay? No. No, I no. am not shaming jobs. I am not shaming anybody going to uh, to a job. And I actually like part-timers in network marketing more than I like full-timers in network marketing. We can get into that conversation too. Thanks. But I will tell you, it, it baffles me. Like, Nobody is saying anything about your cubicle in the sense that it was funny though. Like, but if you're miserable doing that and you can understand that supplementing an income could bring in an extra couple hundred dollars a month and you do not have to do this remotely full time, like, who are you for not, like, what are you saying about yourself by knocking those men or women's hustles? It just does not make any logical sense to me. Um, but I mean, I, I love people who have jobs. I love people who you know, are in their career path of choice. What I don't understand, what I don't understand is people who, this wasn't for you. And you violently and viciously attack it for people that it is for. And you don't take down, you don't talk, you don't talk about the profession. You literally talk about the people. I can understand why someone might talk about the people because the people who actually do succeed monetarily within these systems only do so by taking advantage of multiple people in their downline. Yeah. That's how these systems work. You cannot actually rise to the top of an MLM without victimizing multiple people. It's not possible because they're built this way. So 
I don't necessarily know that everybody who has some success in an MLM is malicious or is, is trying to scam anyone necessarily. Yeah. Sometimes you can get in early and get kind of lucky and you're not doing anything to hurt people on purpose. But most of the time, it's not quite that way. You yeah. know that your downline is not making money. You yeah, know I mean, that you're you telling people that. Yeah, I you would have to know that. I don't know how you wouldn't know yeah. that. Yeah, so if, if people are attacking the people... While I think that going for ideas rather than attacking people is generally better, most of the people who are near the top are those who have deliberately taken advantage of people further down. Yeah. That's why they would attack you. Yeah, and the reason that we don't talk about like, office jobs or cubicle jobs in the same way that we would talk about people working in MLMs or distributors for MLMs is because we don't have any reason to think that those are pyramid schemes. I mean, are there problems with uh, office jobs and uh, work in America in general? Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I have an entire video about yeah. that on my channel. I've critiqued nine to five jobs too, but they're not pyramid schemes though. So that's like why we don't talk about it in the same way. Yeah, but then that, that, I don't have much tolerance for people. We're talking about profession. And you're like, well, then why are you making fucking YouTube videos about me? Like, this is very weird. So I do want to address this part, too. Like, I understand kind of a little bit what they're saying. Like, if it, you guys are just supposed to be critiquing the profession, then why are you making targeted videos about people? I can understand that a little bit, but also it's in order to talk and have discussions about this type of thing, we're gonna have to respond to what people are saying, which means doing what I'm doing right now, responding to what you're saying. Yeah. And I'm not attacking anyone or being vicious, but you're putting yourself out there publicly to defend, especially specifically these two women. They're very active on their Instagram defending the MLM business model. So like, I'm gonna have to address you specifically. It's true. Yeah. And that's what another person was, uh, responded they were like are so can they just like set it straight like are we predators or are we victims because it changes with the wind because it's like oh these people are predators um you know preying on vulnerable women and then in the next breath it's like oh my god they're victims of brainwashing it's like pick a side <laughs> uh i mean that's a, that's a long conversation we can get into um because i'll tell you my i mean some of you don't i see a lot of people hitting follow hopefully on both sides right yeah. Um, and some of you don't know my story. Then I I was in a I was in a basement when I started all of this. The story's never changed. And my best friend from from when I was five years old is now in business with me for the first time ever. I've never recruited friends and families. This is like very new for me. Oh. Um, I was like the victim, though. Like I'd be the person you would say is the victim. I was in the basement. I was in a vulnerable position. My my car didn't work and my my lifestyle was terrible and I couldn't go out with friends. It was like as soon as I took control over that and I said, wait a minute, so it's just a sales model. All I have to do is sell. And then if I want to sell an opportunity, then I can do that too. And then I can choose. I don't, I have a problem with the, if I want to sell an opportunity, how, sell, how is that sales? Like you're not selling anything. You're selling That's someone else the ability to sell yeah like that's that's recruitment. It's recruitment you're rewording it so it sounds not so bad and if it's recruitment just say recruitment the product that you're trying to sell in selling the opportunity is not the same across the board if you get into an mlm relatively early especially like in a new place or something like that where it hasn't become oversaturated have fun finding a market like that then you're not selling the next person down the line the same opportunity that you received Mm, You're yeah, selling them a tiny fraction of the same opportunity. And then when they sell opportunity from there, they're selling even less of a fraction. Yeah. That's, that's why it's point. not fair. You're not selling the same product in selling the same opportunity over and over to multiple people yeah. in the same market. Choose if I want to coach and teach and train this, that, or the third. Okay. As soon as I became, you know, the 1% or even like the 5%, you know, I don't even think I was at the top when people started going, oh, 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 oh. It went from like, well, she was a victim, okay? She was absolutely a victim. And then she got so brainwashed by the whole entire thing and she had so much success that uh, 
that uh now she's the predator it's like you like wait a minute hold on hold on i actually think that there's a way to rectify the you are brainwashed or at least you are succumbing to undue influence is probably a better way to say it uh and the you are preying on other people there is data that shows that what you are doing harms the majority of people as long as you're defining harm as people are losing money. This opportunity that you're selling people makes most people lose money. Yeah, the majority of people make no money or lose money. Right, and you think that's okay. I think in most instances, if you looked at this from the outsider's view, you would think, oh, that's not cool. You know, people shouldn't be doing something like that. But you're in it, you're around people who all believe the same thing, a lot of the time your friends, and I guess not all of your family, but many of your friends, your social circle becomes MLM when you get into this. If you're successful, that happens too. You have an echo chamber around you that tells you that what you're doing and taking advantage of people is okay. You're succumbing to undue influence and you're being a predator at the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, and I, the line between, like, it's not black or black and white. Like, you can be a victim and then gradually transition to being the predator, I guess, yeah. if you want to call it that. Like, it's not either or. Like, that's just not how it works. The MLM model works by victimizing people and turning those very victims into the predators. You're not actually making sense. Because I chose to be successful in something, just like you can choose to be successful in whatever you want. You can't, the idea that you can choose to be successful and you can just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, like that's a very naive way of looking at the world. It's just simply not true that anyone who wants to be successful can just work hard enough and be successful. Yeah. That's just. People enjoy different levels of privilege. I mean, I in no way think that it would have been the same level of difficulty for someone who was more of a minority to get the following that I did by talking about the subjects that I did. I think it would have been a whole lot harder yeah. if I was not white and if I was not male. I think it would be much, much harder. And so I acknowledge that I had a lot of privilege coming into doing this. Yeah. And so I'm not going to tell people, oh yeah, if you can just do anything that you set yeah. your mind to. No people with privilege can succeed faster. Yeah, and it's not just priv privilege. I mean, I think that there's other external pressures like market saturation. Like they always act like market saturation isn't a thing, but if there isn't enough demand for whatever product your MLM is selling, it just, it doesn't work <laughs> out mathematically yeah. that every single distributor can make money. Right. Because if the demand's not there, if there's no one buying the product, then there, people aren't gonna be able to sell that product. So there are external factors, whether it's privilege or market saturation, that make it so not everyone can just be successful mm -hmm. if they just will themselves to be successful. That's just not how the world works. And we should get into de like determining what the word success even means. We can totally define that. But like, you can't say both. You can't. you can't tell me I was a victim 11 years ago and then now I'm the predator because I've had a good experience due to my work. It doesn't make logical sense. But we're not really speaking to logical people, so there's that. I mean, given that there's one side of this whole debate that actually has data and scientific research to back up their points and the other does not doesn't really bode well for you calling the, the opposition illogical. Yeah, and also, we're the ones being vicious when you're saying, you're like calling us illogical? Okay. Damn it, you just said something, we can talk about this. What did you literally just say? I don't know, a lot. I, I don't know. <laughs> that's why I do the notebook thing, man, because I start rambling and then- Literally, that's what I need to do. I have my notebook over here, but I came to the window. Um, but Maybe the success thing, I don't know. It's the success thing. Okay. I success. Why don't we find success? Because that's another thing that we get a lot of shit for, is that they're saying, okay, well, you know, you need to, like, everyone's saying, oh, you're going to be a millionaire. You're going to quit your job. You're going to drive the free car. You're going to go on vacations. But, like, success doesn't look like that because for most people an extra three hundred dollars a month is life changing that is successful if you are doing something that just moves the needle in your life a little bit i mean i would agree that 
yeah, if, if that's what someone's going for is making that, that little bit of extra money, then that is success. But you just said that everyone's telling them that they're going to be a millionaire. If you're expecting to be a millionaire and then you make $300 a month, that's a, that's a serious failure. Yeah. And to be fair, later on, they are going to critique and say that people shouldn't be oh, saying that's... that people are going to be millionaires. That's good. But still, I don't think people should even be saying that you'll make $300 because the stat is 99.7% of people don't make any money or lose money. It's not that 1% are successful. Yeah. It's that the majority of people don't make money. So even saying, even trying to sell this opportunity to people by saying that you can make an extra $200, $300 is an exaggerated income claim. Yeah. You shouldn't be saying that either. You should say what the truth is. And the truth is, you will statistically most likely not make any money or probably lose, lose money. money. Right? So what, even though you are Jesse Lee and you're super duper successful, you know, the one, that doesn't mean that that's what success looks like for everybody. And if they're not you, then they're failing. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, good Lord. Yeah, let's go into this. So <laughs> success to me when I started was $300 a month, period, full stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, I did not, you, and, and to be totally honest, if I had been recruited by somebody who said to me, do you know you can make a million dollars or millions of dollars a year doing this? I would have never signed up I because like I would have been like, scam alert, scam alert, scam alert, Ponzi <laughs> scheme, here, ah! like I would have been like, um, hell no, you freaking <laughs> scammy. Scammer, scammer, McScammerson. Like, yeah. I would have never been interested. My interest level was I cannot pay my bills. I'm getting my rent increased by $300 a month. I have one month left to make an extra $300 a month. My job, I cannot get a $300 a month raise like this. It's not yeah. a thing. So I had to figure something out or I get evicted. This is the real story. Yeah. I mean, I've told it a million times. So I'm like, oh my God. Okay, so. I just need $300. I literally just need to make $300. What can I do for $300? And I asked the person I'm renting the room from in the basement. I said, well, I don't know how to, I, I can't, I don't know how to make $300 a month. And they said, I don't know, start one of those at home businesses. And I said, like Avon? She's like, yeah, like Avon. I'm like, I am not selling Avon. Like I'm like, I'm 22, you know, at the time. Right. So I'm like, that's not happening. Success was $300. And I mean, big success. That was life changing $300 a month. Yes. For me, it's like, how, how can you say it's not successful if I'll say all kinds of weird scenarios. If a, if a single mom has an extra $50 so she can go get what she wants from the grocery store or from the buy a pair of shoes she's had her eyes on or buy, you know, go to Target and not feel bad about buying a candle for herself or whatever. That I mean, I'll say it again, statistically speaking, you won't make an extra $50 a month. You won't make enough money to go and buy yourself shoes from Target. You will most likely 99.7% chance of not making money or losing money. So selling this opportunity as a way to make supplemental income is still an exaggerated income claim. Also, statistically speaking, the people who actually make something like $50 a month or 100 or $300 a month, have put in more hours of work in order to get that than you would put in doing a minimum wage job. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good and point too. Minimum wage jobs are horribly abusive. Yeah. I think we'd both agree. It, it, our minimum wage is ridiculous. It should be tripled or quadrupled yeah. for it to even be fair. <laughs> but still, you're making less than seven twenty-five an hour in the U.S. Yeah. If if you're doing this uh, enough to to make you know, fifty, three hundred dollars. Yeah. I mean the only upside with MLM is that you could work it from home or they say you can work it from wor wherever you are. But I mean if you're still working, technically you're still on your phone, that's still time away from your family or other things that you wanna do. So I don't like see that being an upside. You might as well just go get a part time job or work a couple extra hours somewhere or do something else. Like a Who's to say success is even monetary? Right? Yep. Because there are so many people. Okay, so I'm like really big on TED Talks. I'm really big on personal development. I'm big on all this stuff, right? <laughs> and I was listening to this TED Talk. I think it was just yesterday. And they're talking about how one of the most dangerous things to somebody's actual overall health, not just mental health, not just 
physical health, not just emotional health, overall welfare and quality of life and length of life is in direct correlation to the amount of happiness they have in relationships, in relationships. This is not MLM conversation. This is scientifically data proven information. Okay. One of the longest studies on age ever, the longest study on age ever to exist. Yep. You have just taken people away from each other for almost two entire years now. And you're telling me it's not success. If somebody joins a opportunity, joins a business and finds some of their best friends, because what network marketing really does is it turns complete strangers into friends, which by the way, is just like anything. Everyone was once a stranger before yeah. they were a friend. So don't get all huffy puffy on that either. Okay. They yeah, I agree that that happens and that's not a problem. It is like anything. That's, that's cool. What happens if you leave the business though? Or what happens if you go to another MLM? Will your upline tell you to stop being friends with them? Yeah. Will, if, if your family speaks out against it, will your upline tell you to disown them? These things are things that we have heard directly yeah. from people. They've happened to people that are very close to us. And she does go on to say, and sorry, I've, I've watched this and Drew hasn't. <laughs> um, she does go on to say that she's had people that have left the business that she's still friends with, which is great. That's like, good. that's awesome. I'm glad. But when we talk to people that have left MLMs, that's not the typical experience. It's very rarely the case. Very rarely do you stay friends. Usually anyone that you had as friends when you're in an MLM, they stop talking to you when you leave. So that's a rare example. They get huffy puffy on everything, but like it turns strangers into friends and friends into family. And when I look at my friend circle now, it is not conditional based off of if they're in business with me or not. I've had plenty of people leave business and they are still absolutely family members to me, right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. But I would have never met them if I didn't have the relationships. And you know what else is successful? Turning your... Well, another thing I'll say while she's talking about the whole friends thing is if you want to make more friends, you don't have to join an MLM to do that. Like there's tons of other ways that you can make a group of friends if that's what your end goal is if that's what success is for you i think that i think that mlms do often market themselves as this is a way to make friends you know i've seen young living doTERRA uh lula Roe especially do that say you are going to have like this sisterhood this christian sisterhood yeah uh, and in a way that's what she's doing too uh, hopefully her mlm i don't actually even know what it is it's called prove it they sell like supplement or yeah like a bunch of supplements and like healthcare products of course that's a yikes <laughs> but yeah hopefully it's not as toxic as many others are but yeah they will market the community to you and that's kind of a sign of a high control group uh, of a group that is manipulative you know like oh this is a group of people that will love bomb you and like give you this conditional love if you leave, things do happen. Apparently not in her case. Yeah. That's great. Again, yeah. I don't really think that that's very I mean, common. I'm glad that she's not ending friendships with people that leave her business. Like that's a good thing that she's doing. But she is kind of redefining success over and over and over again so that no matter what happens to someone that's in an MLM, they can still say, well, you were successful in this aspect. So if you weren't successful with making you know, thousands of dollars. Well, you didn't make $50, so that's success. Oh, you didn't make $50. Well, at least you made some friends. It's like you're constantly redefining it. So the MLM, it's never the MLM's model's fault. Yeah. It's always the person. Exactly. So from somebody who's completely underdeveloped as a human being into, whoa, hold on a minute. Now I'm educated. Now I understand about NFTs. Now I understand about uh, wealth management. Now I understand about personal development and speech. Now I understand about sales. Now I can take my sales information and go get a job at Burlington Coat Factory. I don't know where that just came from, right? And go sell whatever. They Is there any evidence that MLMs provide training that actually generalizes to other work experience? Yeah. It, it, I'm sure there are people that have been very successful in MLMs that have then gone on to be successful doing things that aren't MLM related or direct marketing related at all. Is there any research that shows that these are actually beneficial as like training programs? Do a majority or even a significant portion of people take usable skills from being in an MLM yeah. to the job market? I highly, highly doubt that. I highly doubt that. But if it is the case and we'd like to see the data on that. Yeah, show us the data <laughs> and we'll like 
change our minds yeah, like that like because show that's, state on it. <laughs> that's how we work. Right? Like couches, whatever they sell, right? You can take these skills that you learn in this. That is a, that is success. Yes. Success, and you can deploy that into the world. So to me, it's like, for me, for me, yeah, I'm, I am the anomaly. I am not the norm. And I say this on every single podcast I open. Do not listen to what I'm saying as an income claim. Do not think that I am normal. Do not think that you're going to join and you're going to get rich quick. I will outwork every single person in the space and not even just network marketing in the business world, right? I am, that's just, that's just my DNA. Is it because you're outworking people or is it because you have thousands of people in your downline? Is it about your work or is it about other people's work? What yeah. success is for me is different than you. Yeah. But it's different than all the people watching this as well. Correct. And so I think that that's a conversation that network marketers also need to start having is like make it realistic. And like, I hate the term, I hate the phrase realistic because anything that I've ever done is not realistic. Anyone has told me to do anything like that's never going to happen. That's not how it's going to be. Like I need you to set more realistic goals. <clears throat> But like you, we can't be casting vision for people and like highlighting these multimillionaires and all these things, thinking that like that's the only version of success. We need to have a wider, more, like a deeper understanding of what success looks like in this business. And it's not just, oh, I came in and I made millions of dollars. Same, I wanted to make $500 a month as a stay-at-home mom. That, would, like, that, that wasn't like my first paycheck success. Like if yeah. one day I can make $500 a month, I would have been mind blown and just, you know, so I, I think that conversation about success um, needs to be had by everyone. Yeah. I think one of the most important conversations because yeah. I think you make men and women feel like crap when they're in the journey. And like yeah. the reason I work the way I work is a, because it's who I am in my DNA, like I said, but second of all, I like showing people what's actually possible. Yeah. So if I'm the pace setter for the whole profession, by all means, I just want to show you what, what you can do. It doesn't mean you have to do it. It just, I'm trying to show you what's possible, but to what you just said is so important. So I want to back it up to that too many people. And I'm talking about leaders now, because I know there's leaders watching this right now. They're probably like hiding in the shadows a little bit. It's cool. We see you. It's all good, boo. Well, we don't see you, but we know where you, we know you're there sitting in the wheat fields. Okay. Like hiding behind the bushes. It's cool. We're to listen, but not. Yeah. If I could give you any directive, please start sharing the stories of very much so real people and very much so, like your highlights from the other. I was like, oh my God, girl, you oh. gotta save this. Like it is so important that people hear real stories and it is so important people understand that supplemental income in not even just 2022 but we're in 2022 is so important and i post i mean i agree with her on they need to stop like mlms need to stop showcasing just the rare few that yeah. make you know thousands hundreds of thousands millions of dollars but if they were to show the real stories from people in MLM, the majority of people, like the, their stories would mostly just be, oh, I tried it for a year or two. I ended up losing, you know, a couple hundred dollars or I lost thousands of dollars. That would be the real story. Yeah, I mean, statistically, the majority of the stories are those of not breaking even. Yeah. So if they want to be realistic, they want to show what being in an MLM is actually like for most people like apparently they do, then statistics could be helpful here, <laughs> yeah. but apparently we're not going to acknowledge those. Yeah, like sh sharing the stories of people that are able to supplement their income with, you know, extra 300 400 $500 a month is not the norm at yeah, all. Yeah, like, like you that, said. Those aren't real stories. The real stories are people who lose money. Stuff intentionally. Like for me, yeah, I go to a gas station. I don't care what the price is, okay? I just don't. Um, it's just a stage of life that I'm in, right? I drive supercars. You can't, you shouldn't be driving a supercar if you're looking at. I also like how they're talking so much about like, oh, we need to stop showcasing millionaires. We need to talk about real stories or talk about people's real stories. And then she all of a sudden starts talking about how she drives supercars. Okay. Pennies <laughs> on the, on the whatever. That just is not logical. Okay. So, but I sit there and I still post in my stories the gratitude for being able to fill it up, regardless of what the price was on it. Yep. And the reason I do that is because 
when I started this, I, this is like people, the girls who get it will get it. The girls who don't, don't. When I started, I was driving a Ford Focus CX3 like 2001. And it was like the ugliest color. It was a stick shift. It was manual because it's cheaper when it's manual because a lot of Americans can't drive manual, right? So, and I'm from Maryland. And in Maryland, we have the Appalachian I know Mountains. I don't know if you, you, your face is telling me you didn't know I'm from Maryland originally. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm from Maryland. We're from the, from the mountains, Maryland. And I would throw the car in neutral and coast down the hills to save gas money. And my brother was always like, you're going to blow out the transmission on that thing. I said, I don't care if I can roll up and get like an extra 10 miles on this tank of gas. I yeah. never got to fill up a tank of gas. I never got to do that. Yeah. Never. So yeah. when I go and I do fill up a car now, I do take the photo because my gratitude, I still go to that place of, damn, I remember exactly what it's like to lie to my friends and say, no, 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 I I, I no, I. I can't go out. Um, no, we're not going. I, I, I'm just really tired. I wasn't tired. I was broke. Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember what it was like to, you don't know if your car is going to turn over and start or not. I remember what it was like to, to have to get really creative in carpooling to get to meetings in Maryland, which is not a big state, but because I didn't have money. I had like $5 to contribute to a gas pool. Mm -hmm. Like that's where it started. So if you look at the whole picture, of what success is. Yeah, you're right. It started out as $300 a month. And then when I was like, oh, I can make $300 a month. Hold on a minute. Okay. It went, can I make five? And then I made 500. And then I went, can I, can I make a thousand? Mm? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then it, it was never, I didn't, I never joined this for free cars. I never joined this for free trips. Mm -hmm. I never joined this for private jets. I never joined this thinking I could make a million dollars or more a year. I never joined this for anything. I joined this because I was broke. Yeah. And I felt like I had no other option. There was no Uber Eats when I, well, I couldn't Uber eat in any way because my car couldn't make it to your house. So <laughs> but like, there was no Uber Eats. There was no Grubhub. Though. There was no Uber, no DoorDash. No, that the gig economy didn't exist when I started in this. Yeah. And so that, I just wanted to harp on that conversation a little bit because I, it drives me nuts for you to say 1% of people are successful. What? What? Again, the stat is not 1% of people are successful. It's 99.7% .7 of people make no money or lose money. That's the stat. I think, I don't know if she's purposely doing that. I'm not going to assume that she is, but there is a difference between those two statements. You would think that being a professional in this, she would know the statistics about her own. Well, her you, yeah. I, I don't want to assume that she's purposely like saying it in a different way. I think it's still, even if she doesn't know, I still think it's irresponsible to be that ignorant because yeah. then you don't, you're not fully informed on the opportunity well, that you're selling someone else. Well, that, but then they'll also be like, well, that stat isn't reliable because John M. Taylor was just bitter about his MLM experience or whatever, yeah. So I, she could possibly be not saying it because she doesn't want people to like Google that and find that John M. Taylor. I wrote. mean, argue with the numbers, not with he sour grapes. Yeah. <laughs> like that's just a baseless assertion, argue yeah. with the numbers. It's also strange to me here that she's saying we shouldn't be telling people that they're going to be super rich doing this. We shouldn't be advertising this and selling this opportunity with stories of people becoming millionaires. We should be talking about real stories. But when she got in, she said that success for her looked like $300 a month. But then she realized that she could make five and then more and then more. And now she's a multimillionaire. So, I mean, isn't... Isn't that still just selling the story yeah. of being a millionaire? I mean, can't you be grateful in taking that picture of being able to fill up your supercar and just save it in your in your not camera roll to tell anyone. and not have to like go out and, and do this? Because uh, I mean, that that's an advertisement for being an yeah. MLM millionaire. It's it's still the same thing. Even yeah. if you're telling people, oh no 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 no, you'll start with making like three hundred dollars a month, and you'll then you'll work your way up. It's still exactly the same yeah. thing. Yeah, it's just done in a more humble, subtle way. Yeah, but yeah, you can't talk about we need to be sharing real stories, and then your next sentence be talking about how you just went to the gas station and didn't care how much the gas price w was and filled up your supercar. Yeah. 
And it's true, like, so many. I mean, if you talk, well, I'll backtrack on that. But um, I think that so many people, like, they don't, they, they think it has to be this huge thing. And they feel like, oh, I have to be a Jesse Lee or I have to be somebody who's at the top 1% or I have to be all stuff. And like, you don't, you got to talk to a couple people. And like, it's when you're talking about Uber Eats, or you're talking about getting a gig, a part-time job at Starbucks or a part-time babysitting job. All of these things my friends do, but they're not willing to like, you know, pick up their phone and utilize something that they're already doing. Like to me, that that's a huge missed opportunity. Like people are going farther away from where they want to be like home with their family, whatever, um, to make 10 bucks an hour, which nobody's nobody's knocking that, but like you have an opportunity literally in the palm of your hand and people are like, you're a scam artist. I mean, the difference is with babysitting with a part-time job with all those other things, you're guaranteed a minimum, you're guaranteed minimum wage with that. Are there, is, is there a problem with minimum wage? Yes, but that's a different discussion. With MLM, you have no guarantee. Like, you're not going to be making any money, especially at first. Like, there's no guarantee of income. So that's why people would rather go babysit or do these other jobs because they're going to get money. (laughs) And maybe also people that would do these other, like, just small gigs instead of an MLM can use Google and look look up income disclosure statements and try to parse those incredibly and purposely confusing things out. Or check out the John M. Taylor study. Yeah. I mean, just using Google would, would explain this quite well, I yeah. think. <laughs> yeah. And I think that hurts people, by the way. So, I mean, the whole conversation hurts people. This entire anti... It's not even just... This is going to be a deeper conversation for a second. But it's not even just the anti-MLM movement right now. It's this anti-movement period that yeah. I don't understand. This whole let's cancel people because I don't agree with 100% of what they do. I don't understand. I've never been somebody who's like, oh, you know what? I don't like what Colleen does. So I'm going to go ahead and go on all her stuff. I'm going to report her. I'm going to have all my friends report her. I'm going to comment. But like you guys, let me give you an example. So when people try to tell you that, um, no, 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 we are, we just have a problem with the profession. We're not attacking people. No, we're not, we're not a bully for calling you out. Colleen, like, they literally called Colleen a holo- Holocaust haircut the other day. Mm-hmm. Like, that's not bullying. They, no. they throw on, like, wigs to make fun of colored extensions in my hair and tell me, say I look like a man, I'm manic, I'm bipolar, um, she's absolutely psychotic, she's mentally unstable. You're you're not talking about profession. I do want to say, if people are doing that, yeah. that is absolutely not okay. Completely unacceptable. Um, yeah, completely unacceptable. Yeah. That is attacking and attacking the person in that case and i apologize if that's happened to you guys because you're both beautiful women and yeah i'm just sorry that that's happened um but that doesn't mean all anti-mlmers or even most anti-mlmers do that we are talking about ideas here we're not attacking you or canceling you as a person yeah trying to get people triggered so that they report people and so if you can sit on that throne and feel high and mighty about your cancel culture and your group think good for you good for you but uh i could never be that person and so i don't even get angry about any of this because the level of compassion i have for people who are that venomous and they think they're saving the world in anything whether it's anti mlm or it's anti whatever bill rogan or it's anti anything i'm like who do you think you're saving because you're saving nobody so are they saying that you can't be anti anything i mean i i'm not sure if they're saying that you can't be anti anything but you, you know that boycotts and protests historically have actually worked. Yeah. That's, that's like, I mean, women's suffrage yeah. came out about that. It was anti-patriarchy. I mean, liberation of the slaves yeah. was, was anti-slavery. In order to make any progress socially, there's always been someone that's, or some institution that's required critique. Yeah, unions, I mean, yeah. were just, oh, these are just a bunch of anti-capitalist, lazy slackers. <laughs> no, 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 they actually had something real to do. And yes, there are absolutely people who drag the rest of people who are trying to do something down with them by engaging in the mockery that yeah. that she mentioned. And that's not acceptable. But don't paint with a broad brush here. 
because being against something that you can demonstrate harms people or you are advocating against demonstrable falsehood, yeah. I don't think that's a problem. In fact, we need that. I bet that there's something that you are against that you would be absolutely on board with. I mean, People lobbying against however publicly. Even how they titled this live stream was something like anti-MLM anti discussion. So you're anti-MLM or so you are anti-something. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, like there's nothing wrong inherently with being anti or against something, especially when that thing has been demonstrated to be harmful, which MLM has been. I, I just think it's so toxic. And I said this, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm calling it publicly now because we've got, you know, 500 here. We've got, I've got hundreds here. The podcast, God knows, that's, well, that's huge. Um, and then 50 over here. I'll tell you right now, I called something out the other day, and I know it will, I know what's going to change. I made a point, and I know you saw it because you commented to me about this. You are horrifically anti women in this movement in particular. Horrifically. Like, the level of women hating women in the anti-MLM movement is stunning it's to just, me. And just, if you would like to say that I'm wrong, I would like to I would like to respectfully ask you, where are the videos about the men? Hi. I've made videos about men. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually I think this is the first time that I've made a whole video where there haven't been any men in it. Uh, I mostly critique the MLM coaches who are men, yeah. who, whether it's Eric Worre, Fraser Brooks, Tim Sales. I mostly critique them. Um, yeah, so they we do exist. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> Want to talk about the network marketing. Now there will be men videos. I'm calling it right now. They're going to start making anti-men videos in MLM just to be like, no, see, I, I can talk about him too. It's too late. I just called you out on your BS, you BSer. Right. Okay, but um, <laughs> it'll, they'll, they'll come out now, though. Like, they'll leave that little sound bite out of this. That'll get edited out. <laughs> but it's okay. We got the recording. I know it's the truth, but here's the real truth. Network marketing is dramatically female-centric. I believe it's 76% women, if my statistics are correct. Mostly women. Okay, so if it's 76% women then doesn't it make sense that the majority of anti-MLM videos would feature women if the industry is predominantly women? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I mostly, I have historically mostly critiqued men, but it makes sense that in the anti-MLM sphere that it would be mostly critiques of women like these two individuals because the industry mostly has women. Exactly. I mean, I make critiques of religious leaders relatively often and they're all men. Yeah, that doesn't mean you're anti-men. <laughs> I'm not trying to be against men, it's just that- They happen to be men. Yeah. Yeah. Now, women are natural sellers. 80% of purchases made in a household are, are decided upon by women. Women shop, women sell, women buy. It is very natural because we are talkers. This is all the way the female brain works compared, compared to the male brain, okay? Mm -hmm. If you can, you can look up science studies, all right? It's, it, yep. it's dangerous when you, when you offend a smart woman, right? So. Anyway, all right, so 76% of women, if you look at the businesses where men are making a lot of money, because it is true, at the top, there are a lot of men, mm -hmm. a lot, okay? I'm on every single stage, every single time, all of them, all of them, surrounded by men with these gigantic checks. You look at the Network Marketing Hall of Fame, the million dollar a year earners, it's man, 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 woman, man, 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 woman, woman, man, man, tons of men. Men, I will tell you, are the ones who solely recruit. Men. Men are the ones, it's their nature to be very, very boom, instant driven, action driven, get the result, be done, okay? They're recruiting however many legs they need, whether that's two or three, generally speaking. They'll get two recruits, three recruits. They'll stack whatever they need to stack. And the women are the ones building ethnically under them with customers, with team members, running calls, nurturing, running incentive contests, doing all yes. of the nurturing work. And you damn right, it's a man. So I will tell you, I very intentionally joined only a woman mm -hmm. when I chose my upline for this company. Absolutely yep. only joined a woman. Yeah. 
Okay. Is she kind of admitting then to get to the top? It's about recruiting. Yeah. Because she just said, and also that that's unethical. Yeah, she just because she just said, oh, everyone that's at the top, they're all men, and it's because they are the ones that recruit. So isn't that admitting that to get to the top, you need to recruit? Also, she's complaining about basically being victimized by the men at the top of yeah. these companies. But earlier she was saying that she can't be painted as a, as a victim by being involved in this. For the record, because people go, oh, you can never out earn it, out mine. Um, yeah, you can. I dramatically out earn an absolute living legend in network marketing. So thank you. Take a seat. Yeah. <laughs> Debunk oh. all their little stupid rumors, right? So I'm telling you that because if you want to attack people and you want to attack the model, do not attack the housewife who wants to make a hundred dollars a month and save a hundred dollars a month for a year and buy herself a never full bag because she's never had a Louis Vuitton. Do not attack the the student who is drowning in debt because for whatever reason our government does not get rid of student loans okay we do not forgive student loan debt it's written into our into our into our laws okay who wants to pay off their student loans how dare you how dare you and why don't you actually ask them their customer numbers because it's it's amazing oh well they order their product underneath of a customer account okay so that's one customer that, that's one customer, okay? So what about the other thousands and thousands or hundreds and hundreds or dozens and dozens of customers they have? If that's one customer that woman has to, yes, get another source of income from her, from her business, and now she has, you're just ignoring the hundreds of other customers? Because that doesn't make sense to me. And if you're worried about a sustainable business model, also doesn't make sense to me. Because I, I was terminated very open about this. I was terminated wrongfully from my first ever network marketing company. Okay, I sued that company for anybody who's wondering what happened. I won, I got paid, okay? I got paid in arbitration, right? That's just the fact, it's all, I think that's public knowledge I got paid, so I think I'm allowed to say that now. If I didn't, whoops, bye. <laughs> Whatever, okay? So I got terminated, sued them, got paid. Mm -hmm. That business, because I built it with customers, relationships, real people, that business is still thriving, even though I'm not there. Yep. Because I build real businesses. And yep. so when I look at the customer ratio compared to the recruiting ratio in my business and a lot of women's businesses, I know you're in a business that also retails incredible products as well. There's way more customers. Way. And women are not natural recruiters. They are natural gatherers. Mm -hmm. But we have huge customer pods. I mean, I think that if it is the case that they have more customers than they have recruits, I'd like to see the data on that. I'd like to yeah. see proof of that. Because if that is the case, and I think that is something to think about. However, I want to see customers who are outside of the business, not people who joined and yeah. never did anything with their business that now or haven't been successful or haven't made money with their business that you're now calling customers because they're not meeting certain requirements. I mean, like actual legitimate customers that you're selling products to that are outside of the company. Yeah. If that's the case, and I think that is something to think about, and I'd like to see the data on that. Go ahead and send us the data. Yeah, like we'd like to see that. But I kind of doubt that that's the case because I watched another one of her lives and she was talking about how she's almost she's almost made it to 10,000 recruits. She's almost recruited 10,000 people under her, Whoa. which I'm like, I don't think it's possible to have more than how how many customers yeah, must how many you have? Like if you have that many customers, like, wow, like you have a billion dollar business right there. But I, I kind of doubt that I I'm thinking that most of the people she's talking about are actually recruits that she's redefining as customers because they don't sell a certain amount mm. or something like that. That's what I'm thinking. To rewind a little bit, she did say something that I very, very much agree with. If you're doing anti-MLM content, she's right. Do not go after low-level people, yeah. a student, yeah. a housewife, you know, whatever people who are at the very bottom just trying to get into it. Don't screenshot your friends and family's posts and then go like publicly just shit all yeah, over them. That. That's no. terrible. Go after, if you're going to go after the ideas of someone, go after the ideas of the people at the top. The point of mockery and public criticism are to 
take power away from those who have a disproportional amount of it and redistribute that power to the people. That's the point of public criticism and even mockery. So do it to the powerful, don't do it to the vulnerable. Yeah. All right, guys, that wraps up part one. Be sure to check in later this week for part two. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and a huge thank you to my patrons who help make these videos possible. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. If you'd like to check out my socials, my Instagram handle is Taylor underscore the underscore antibot, and my Twitter handle is at the antibot. If you'd like to support this channel financially, a link to my Patreon will be in the description, and I'll see you all in the next one. Say bye. <laughs>